<laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. It's all yours. All right. So can everybody can see this okay? Um, I thought I just would give you a little walk through my garden today. We can all use some color um, and hope um, that these guys are indeed under the snow. Um, so let me just run through. I've been in my garden here in Richmond for, um, I don't know, 35, 36 years. Um, and over the years, I've because I've always worked in gardening, I've had access to a lot of bulbs and other plants. And my garden now includes a ton of different bulbs. And I thought I just would run through the ones that bloom at my house. And you might see some that you don't have. And I'll tell you a little bit about the different ones as we go through. But the, the idea is that um, this shows a little time chart of the, from the early bloomers to the mid-season to the late bloomers. And that's kind of how I've organized the presentation today. So we'll start with the earliest guys, snowdrops. Um, and... What I wanted to say about these is that I tried for many years, I don't know about you guys, but um, to start them from bulbs planted in the fall, which you can buy many places, I never had any luck. And uh, about 10 years ago, a friend of mine gave me a pot of snowdrops that he had dug up in his garden. And from those, I've created thousands around the yard. Um, in England, the only way that they really plant snowdrops is in the green. And that means that you buy them um, as plants that are either about to bloom or have just bloomed and you, and you plant them that way. So um, if you've tried growing snowdrops before and have not had luck, um, try to find someone. I'll, I'll throw my name in the ring as someone you could come over and get some from. Um, and that has really been the secret to success at my house anyway. Um, they like kind of woodland edges. They'll take more shade than most bulbs. And they're just the cheeriest things ever. Um, last spring, because it was so cold for so long, they were in bloom for, I don't know, three weeks or more. Um, they're also a really good bee plant, and um, you'll find that they're just completely covered with bees um, when, they're, when they're blooming. Oh, I threw in a little video. <laughs> so there's... A, you know, each clump, if you can imagine, I have a hundred clumps like this. Every clump is just packed with bees. We do have a beekeeper who lives down the road. All right, the next um, group are snowdrops. And I am, there's two kinds of snowdrops, snow crocus or um, species crocus. Um, these are a little bit smaller than the other ones, which are called giant crocus. Um, they have some different colors that are available. The flowers are a little smaller and they bloom about a week earlier, a um, little shorter too. Um, these are the giant crocus. Um, they come in purple, yellow, white, and then this wonderful um, pickwick, the striped ones. Um, I have these around the yard in different places. I've put them in the lawn, which you see here. And um, the only problem I have with crocuses is chipmunks who seem to just love the bulbs and even after they don't dig them up until june and i they i figure they must be able to smell the bulbs because they all the foliage is gone by then but they'll go through the yard and it just looks like you know someone's come there and just shot up the yard because there's holes everywhere so um i plant more crocus every fall in hopes that i you know i get some at least in the spring they don't dig them up every year but it's just kind of unpredictable um, the next bulb, which I totally love, is um, Shinodoxa, um, commonly called Glory of the Snow. This is the sweetest little bulb if you don't have this. Um, blooms right after the crocus, naturalizes very easily um, from offsets. It also produces um, seeds, and the seeds have a sweet coating on them. And like some other plants, the, the ants are attracted to this coating and will carry the seeds um, a ways away and you'll find them coming up in various places around your yard, thanks to the ants. Um, they come in this wonderful sky blue, which is my favorite. And then they also come in white and a kind of a uh, lavender pink color. Um, this was taken last spring when we had that crazy late snow or one of the late snows. Um, so they're very cold tolerant as all these early spring bulbs are fortunately for us. This is Pushkinia, um, also called striped squill. 
Uh, this is another of my favorites. Um, it's not really naturalized here. I plant a few bulbs every couple of years. I don't know why it doesn't persist, but um, it's just the cutest thing ever, I think. And it has a wonderful little fragrance, kind of like violets or something. I, um, and is a, probably the first um, flower that I cut and bring inside and put in a little vase. Um, just a really great uh, bulb if you can get your hands on it you probably have to mail order these they're usually not um, at a retail store there's just not enough demand for them and I think if they had a better name instead of Pushkinia they probably would be more popular um, Scylla Siberica um, this is the wonderful cobalt blue flowers that create big carpets um, in lawns and gardens. Um, this is a good bulb to put just virtually anywhere. The foliage is really um, grassy and it disappears very quickly. So you don't have this problem with um, foliage hanging around because as you know, with spring bulbs, you need to let that foliage stay until it turns yellow and withers. Otherwise, the bulb won't have enough energy to produce another year of flowers. So this is one of the bulbs and the ones before this, all these tiny ones, um, the foliage goes away really quickly. Um, and these also get spread by um, ants, and um, I have them in the lawn as well, which you see here is a clump in the lawn. Um, these also you can pick and put in a little vase, um, so they're super cute favorites. Um, then we'll go on to daffodils. Um, this, is, this is my yard, believe it or not. Um, so I used to, when I first started the garden here, I put lots of daffodils into the flower beds. And over the years I've dug almost all of them out because the, the clumps of bulbs got so large and the foliage got so messy um, that it flopped all over all the other perennials and plants that were trying to come up. So I gradually put them into the meadow adjacent to the most of the gardens and this is what's happened. So. Um, Early blooming daffodils tend to be trumpets. This is what you see here is yellow and white trumpets. Um, and I'll, I'll go to those in just a sec. What I've put in the flower beds instead is another early bloomer called tete tete And these are just about eight inches tall. Um, so the flowers are smaller, the foliage is finer. Um, and these, so they, they work in a flower bed. They just don't get big and floppy and they multiply, but not in a way that's a problem. Um, and let's see what else I was gonna say about the, oh, they are also very heat tolerant. So they bloom really early, but they last for weeks. Um, so if you don't have tete -a tete I highly recommend it. This is the double tete tete which is so cute. Um, again, the same height and size, a um, little harder to find, but really sweet. It has this kind of little bit of a green um, tint to the flowers. So um, we'll go back to the trumpet daffodils, these really early bloomers. Um, Ice Follies is one of the earliest and has this kind of yellow center. Um, and the other is the yellow version of the trumpets, um, Dutch Master, Yellow River, all the yellow trumpets are kind of pretty similar. Um, and as I said earlier, they're all good naturalizers. So if you really, what you want is just to carpet a bank with daffodils, um, go for trumpets. A lot of the naturalizing mixes will include mostly trumpets because they multiply um, very readily and you get a big show of color really fast. Um, next is hyacinths. Um, not everybody grows hyacinths. I don't know, I don't know why, because I think they're just so wonderful. They have the best fragrance. Um, and I always plant extras to cut and bring inside. Um, they also can be forced. I've had some luck with forcing and some not luck with forcing. Um, but I find they come back um, at least two years. Um, you want to, like all these bulbs, the, the more well-drained the soil is, the better luck you'll have in terms of the perennial nature of the, of the flowers. Um, most bulbs are from kind of um, alpine-ish kind of soils that are thin and well-drained, uh, where they get, it's cold winters, but the summers tend to be hot and dry. And so as we know, our summers are usually, well, last summer was hot and dry, but usually we have a lot of moisture in the soil. Um, both in the winter and the summer, and bulbs don't really like that. And that's the reason why 
Um, many bulbs are not perennial for us. You'll find people in um, like where it's dry, say California or New Mexico or something, will have tulips come back every year for 10 years. Um, whereas here, we can't really count on that with tulips or the same is true for hyacinths. Um, so I usually get two years out of them. Um, there are lots of colors um, and I encourage you to try them all. They're all great. And uh, again, a really great flower to cut and bring inside. You can, if you want, um, pull up, because I plant them often, I replant them every year. You can also dig up the, the plant and um, bring it inside that way too. Um, this is one of the successful years I had in um, forcing them. Um, I've done it in a cold, a neighbor's cold cellar. That's what worked the best. Um, but you could try a, a second refrigerator or something like that. Um, but they are pretty great as forced flowers. Um, next are muscari or uh, grape hyacinths. Again, there's a bunch of different kinds. Um, these are really sweet to cut and bring inside too. They last a long time. They bloom from the bottom up. Bees love them. Um, and this is blue magic. There's also Valerie Finis, which is um, this powder blue color that's really great. Um, and then Arminiacum is the most common one that you, if you just go to the nursery and you look for grape hyacinths, this is the kind, this, these are the ones you'll get. Um, last year I tried for the first time these white ones called Siberian Tiger. And then um, another super cute one is Ocean Magic, which has, uh, it's kind of a two-tone um, so these these last a couple weeks, um, again, the foliage goes away pretty quickly. They're, you see in the back on, of the Ocean Magic on the right, there's that little um, tet -a, double tete-a-tete. -tet. So they're, they're shorter than even the shortest daffodils, but um, a, a really nice um, spring bulb to include in your garden. Um, we'll go on to mid-season daffodils. There's... Uh, tons of them, um, many colors, flower styles, and heights. This is a especially cute one. Um, Thalia is uh, this beautiful, like, white butterflies. Golden Echo is a really strong one. It has that, it looks like kind of a, um, a, a yellow shadow on the petals, um, the Echo. And that's a really good one, too. That's a mid-height. Um, other mid-season ones, Jetfire on the left, um, it's a real cutie, and Kedron, which has these kind of um, salmon yellow petals um, around a orange disc. There also are um, dwarf daffodils. Um, some are sh really short, like I said, with tete-a-tete, -tete, and some to have these little cute little flowers. Um, the one on the left is cheerfulness, and that's a really sweetly scented one with um, multiple flowers per stem. And the one on the right has one flower per stem, but these cute little flowers. And that sun disc blooms very late um, in the season and has very grassy, super narrow foliage. So again, it's a good one if you want to have it in a flower bed. Um, it won't flop all over. It's really the, the trumpets that you want to keep out of your flower beds, which I wish I knew at the beginning. Um, and double daffodils are also super fabulous. Um, Tahiti and then a, a really pretty one, Delna Shaw. Um, these are such good cut flowers. Um, one thing about daffodils, they do have that clear sap in the stem. If you wanna um, put them in a vase, what I recommend is um, cut them, bring them inside, put them in just um, some cool water for about a half an hour or an hour and let some of that sap drain out, pour the water out and then put them in a vase. And at that point you can arrange them with tulips and other kinds of um, uh, branches or whatever you wanna put them in. You just need to get rid of some of that sap, which has kind of, a, it tends to clog up the, um, the openings for the other plants. And so they have a hard time taking up water. So drain out some of that sap and then you're, you're good to go. Um, more daffodils, sorry. Uh, some little late sweet miniatures, um, baby boomer. 
and um, minnow, another super cute ones. And these are the late, the very latest ones that I have. Um, this is Mary Copeland, and then on the left is a, a really ancient daffodil. Um, doesn't have a common name. Um, it was gifted to me when I first moved to Richmond, and um, it it has a gardenia scent. Um, I'm telling you this because you can look for it. It is available out there, um, and blooms Memorial Day weekend. Um, and the only problem with it is that sometimes, some years, if it gets too hot, the the buds um, dry out before the flower opens. They blast. It's called. So some years you won't get these, but um, the years that you do, it's really worth it. So if you can get your hands on Plenus odoratus, um, I highly recommend it. Um, now we're on to the real color. Um, so this is um, my on the right is my flower garden a few years ago. Um, I used to plant a lot of tulips in the beds. And as you'll see a little later, I now plant most of them in the vegetable garden. Um, partly it's just so much easier. Um, it takes a lot of time to put all these bulbs in between the other plants, especially when there are a multitude of other things <laughs> under the ground um, and that you, you dig up a spot for to plant some tulips and up comes you know daffodils and all these other kinds of things and you just create more problems so now i put them in the vegetable garden but they do look beautiful in the flower garden like this and i'll just go through a few of the different kinds of tulips because from early to late bloomers again you can get a month to six weeks worth of flowers um, depending on what kinds of tulips you choose um this is uh double early tulips are about the first to bloom, at least at my house. Um, this is a favorite, Monte Orange. Um, the doubles tend to be shorter than most tulips, maybe 12 to 18 inches tall. Really great cut flowers, and they change a lot. Um, all tulips uh, grow, continue to grow as they um, open. So they'll open, the flower will be um, kind of medium sized. And then over the course of a week or 10 days, the flower gets larger, the stem gets longer. Um, so tulips are kind of unique in that way. And if you buy them um, at the store, you'll probably notice that by the time you're about ready to toss them, they're like six inches longer than they were when you bought them. And florists take this into account when they're arranging with tulips. They put the tulip really deep in the arrangement because they know that the flower is going to, the stem's going to elongate and the flower is going to get larger. Um, so it's fun to watch these guys develop. Um, this is a really very pretty one, um, foxy fox trot. Other kinds of early blooming dap or, uh, tulips um, are the emperor tulips, uh, also called Fosteriana tulips. On the left is orange emperor, um, one of my favorites. It has that green on the outer petal, which I really like. And these flowers get really large. They're um, they get really, t they're tall and really big. Not the, the flowers are tall, the stems are not that tall. And Greggy eyes um, have, are shorter. The flowers are smaller, but they have this kind of lily um, shape to the leaves that I think is really, really beautiful. Um, Veritiflora tulips are the tulips that have green on them. Um, on the left is exotic emperor. That's an early blooming one. Um, just fabulous tulip gets really big and changes every single day. Um, Artist is also a changer. It opens up um, usually a little more orange than this. And as the flowers age, they they become kind of this um, pinkish uh, tan. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, and then flaming spring green has those red flecks in it. Um, that's a taller one. But um, green tulips, if you haven't grown them, really great. Here's how I grow most of my tulips now in the vegetable garden. It takes me a couple hours to plant all these. I, I put tarps down on the walking path, um, dig the soil out of the bed, onto the tarp, lay all the tulips in, put all the soil back in, and call it good. Um, so it saves a lot of time, and I most of the tulips I grow, I'm growing for photography. So it's all I really need to do is take pictures of them. Um, but you, I can, I've also dug them up sometimes when they're just coming up and put them into the flower beds that way. Um, but it's just a, a quicker way to deal with it. Same with the hyacinths, which you see behind there. Um, 
I've done the same thing. Dig them up and put them in. Just it's just like you're putting a potted plant that you buy at the nursery into your garden. Same thing. Um, so that is my current way I do it. Mid-season tulips, um, Darwin hybrids are. You probably heard of these. These are um, the the biggest and burliest tulips that we have to plant. Um, they come in really bright colors. Um, if you want to have tulips that, you know, your neighbors notice, <laughs> these are the ones to go for. They're tall, the flowers are big, the colors are bright. Um, here's two popular varieties. Um, really, they're, they're very beautiful. Um, next to bloom, or really almost at the same time, are triumph tulips. Um, these flowers are not quite as large as the um, Darwin hybrids, but they come in way more colors. And if you're into just creating new color combinations every year, you're probably going to want to plant triumphs because there's just so many more colors available. Um, they're, you know, mid-height, probably 30, 24 to 30 inches, something like that. Really great for cutting, of course. Um, lots to choose from, um, lots of beautiful colors. Here are a couple other kinds of tulips. Um, Grand Perfection is a um, Rembrandt tulip. And so in the old, like 1500s in Holland, there were these, the tulip mania thing had happened, which was actually a, a virus that was in the tulips that made the color break like this. Um, now that Tulips are no longer virused, but the breeders have bred for this same kind of characteristic. And if you look for Rembrandt tulips, you'll see these, these kind of neat flames that are on the petals, like on Grand Perfection. Um, parrots, um, amazing, beautiful for flower arrangements. I have not had a ton of luck with them. Um, and I've grown the white and the black. Um, they are just a little more fiddly than most tulips. So I'd say unless, just don't have your hopes too high if you plant parrots. Um, if you really want to be sure you get a great show of color, um, Darwin hybrids are the way to go. This is a fringe tulip, Lombata, another really nice one. Um, and then the last tulips to bloom are the, almost the last are single lates. These are sometimes called cottage tulips. Um, they're the tallest, they're probably, 36 inches tall um nice big flowers they're pretty heat resistant these are the flower these are the tulips that um they'll plant down in the carolinas and um washington dc and stuff because they'll they'll really take the heat and so these springs when we're having really hot weather um this is a you know a good reason to plant these single late tulips um blushing beauty queen of night Beautiful. The flowers are a little smaller than most of the other single lates on Queen of Night, but the color is really incredible. A um, couple others are Menton and World Expression. Um, great tulips. And closing out the tulip season are the double lates. Um, and here's a couple of them. Like the, sing like the double earlies, they're a little shorter than most tulips, um, but they really... Um, the flowers are huge. They'll fill your whole hand um, once they're mature. So they'll start out smaller, don't be concerned. But over the course of a week or 10 days, they really get bigger and they just keep getting more and more amazing and beautiful. So highly recommend double lates. And um, for cutting, um, if you like to make bouquets, these are, you can't beat them. And last, um, the, the allium land here. Um, I've become a real fan of alliums. And as you can see, these are pictures from my garden. I have a lot of alliums. Um, and I guess there's a bunch of different reasons. One, um, pests don't bother them. Deer don't bother them or um, rodents. Um, many of them are perennial. Um, and they also bloom at a time when the tulips are fading, but the, um, the peonies haven't started and the iris haven't started yet. So um, they fill a bloom time gap um, in the year when you're outside and you just feel like you should have flowers by now. And fortunately there are alliums to, to fill that gap. Purple sensation are the first to bloom. Um, they're about two feet, 
two and a half feet tall. Um, they um, are very perennial, at least for me, they naturalize. So I didn't plant this many that you see in the picture. Um, they have multiplied. And honestly, in this bed, this is one of my perennial beds. Um, last year, I dug out most of them, about probably two thirds of the bulbs, and I put them in the meadow along with the daffodils. Because um, like most alliums, their foliage tends to start yellowing just as the flowers reach their peak. So it's not a great look. And the foliage is much, there's more of it than with a daffodil or a tulip and it just flops all over everything so I just got tired of it looked kind of looking kind of messy if you kept your eyes at this level where the photos taken of it it looked great but if you stood back and you looked at the bed there's a bunch of dead yellow foliage so if you're going to plant purple sensation which is a good one because the bulbs are much less expensive than most of the other um, ornamental alliums um, just put it in a place where you're going to be okay with the foliage not looking great. So there's other things to maybe cover it up. This is a really sweet little allium that I have in my rock garden, um, Allium caritaviens. I think it's um, the foliage, I think is as beautiful as the flowers, maybe even prettier. It's this really beautiful blue when it first comes out with pink edges on the petal, on the um, leaves. And then the flowers, um, kind of look like a um, dandelion in a way. Um, but these are really a nice little guy. And then we get to the big headed alliums. Um, these, His ex Excellency is um, the flowers are maybe five inches across and the stems are about three to four feet tall. Um, so they have a big bold presence in the garden. Um, really exciting, I think. Um, alliums, all of the alliums are really attractive to bees and butterflies, um, and another reason to like them. There's a little bee on that one. This is Globemaster. That's the really big one. These are about as, almost as big as a bowling ball when they get full size. Um, and they're the latest blooming ones. All of the alliums, I, I tend to leave them in the garden, not the purple sensation, but these big headed ones. I let I think that the um, seed heads look as cool as the flowers when they're in bloom. So I, I tend to leave them in the garden for a long time. Um, you can also um, pick them, hang them upside down, dry them and um, spray them with a fixative or with um, a, a colored spray paint, silver, gold, something and um, keep them inside. They last for at least for a full year. This is another allium that I highly recommend, Allium bulgaricum. It goes by a variety of different names. It's one of those plants that they've reclassified a lot of times. Um, but if you look for it under this, you'll probably find it. It's also called Sicilian honey garlic. And unlike the other alliums, this one actually does smell a lot like garlic or onions, um, but I wouldn't hold it against it. This is just a super cool plant. Um, very perennial here in Richmond. Um, it comes back reliably and multiplies for me. Um, it has a little bit of a wonky nature. The stems don't stand straight up like the other guys do. It, they sometimes lean left or right. Um, so just be prepared for that. But um, the bees really love this one. And I just think they're super cool. Um, when they first open the, the flowers, um, hang down and then once the flowers are pollinated they i wish i had a time lapse but they they raise up and point straight up and um so when the seeds are formed the, the flowers are standing straight up it's it's worth getting to, to watch that um allium nigrum um just a smaller flower head but um very charming a little later blooming these are i'm showing you in order of bloom time too so this is another little bit of a later one. Allium Christophii, um, another one that I love, and you can see it there, just the seed heads in the garden. That's um, probably early August, um, and they, I just think they look cool. Um, these are, the flower heads are about probably nine, eight or nine inches across, um, and about a foot tall. Allium Christophii. Um, and the last of the alliums, uh, this is drumstick allium. 
and a new one on the far left there called Forelock, which I grew for the first time last year. That has really stiff, tall stems. It was four feet tall. Um, whereas the, the drumstick alliums, again, they're a little bit wonky. They kind of list left and right. And I have them planted in um, this lavender hedge that I have. Um, I think they'd also be good in like with ornamental grasses or something, but you have to kind of be okay about the fact that they're not going to be that orderly. Um, they bloom um, from the top down. And at first they have this cool bicolor with the green on the bottom and the raspberry on top. Um, so another really great allium. And then I'll just end with a couple pictures of um, from the garden uh, last year, I think. And like I said, the, these are all daffodils that came out of my flower beds. And over 30 years, they've just continued to multiply. Um, this is probably 25% of the ones that I have, maybe. Um, here's that little um, muscari, the grape hyacinth, uh, Valerie Finnis in the rock garden. A good place to put um, muscari, just to show you that if even if you don't have a very large space, um, you can put a dozen bulbs and have a nice little burst of color. Here's the garden from a different view showing, um, you can see in the front, some of the hyacinths that I have along the bed. And there are still some daffodils in there, but most of the daffodils have been moved into the other garden. And just another shot of um, what it often looks like in my vegetable garden. Um, because I, t I pull all these out, um, by the time I'm ready to put in um, tomatoes and peppers, the, the tulips are done, so there's no competition. Um, it's a little hard to pull the bulbs and just toss them, but um, that's what I do. And then here's that bed of, of alliums. So I'm going to try to get out of this and take your questions. There you are. Um, are you there, Martha? I am. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can, thank you. Can, can we all come and visit your place? Can we all? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, wear your mask and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But maybe, I guess we're, we're all probably, there's a lot of gray hair here. But hopefully we'll all be vaccinated by the time spring comes. <laughs> yes. <That's laughs> and then we can all come and hang out. Yeah. Be fabulous. So questions, you can either write them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you. And if you don't know how to use the chat, anybody got a question here? Uh, Miss Lorraine. No, let's see. So we got a hand up here. Uh, yes, Lorraine, you need to unmute. We get you all muted and then we say oh, unmute. I think I've unmuted. You did. Uh, beautiful um, bulbs. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, uh, if you're not pulling your tulips, how long can we expect them to be blooming? A few years? Well, the, the ones that are the most reliable to return are the Darwin hybrids. Um, and you, you could get two, three years depending. It all depends on how well drained the soil is. So if you have a place where the soil is really, I, mean, I don't know if this exists in Richmond, but <laughs> uh, the soil is well drained, put them there. Um, you want to, ideally they're going to get, the soil is, is warm in the summer and they get getting some sun on it. Um, so just keep them out of a heavy soil that tends to be wet. What happens to, to the tulips, the reason they don't come back is that the bulbs, um, they split. So if you dig up a, a tulip bulb in the spring, you'll be able to know whether it's going to bloom again. Because if it's split in two or three pieces, none of those pieces is going to have enough energy to produce another flower. You need to have a bulb that stays entire. And if you can manage that, then you will get flowers the next year. Um, some of the species tulips, the little guys, I, I've heard people have good luck with those coming back. I haven't grown those myself, um, but I would try with the Darwin hybrids and again, just put them in the, the best place you can. And if they, what will happen the second year is you'll probably get smaller flowers um, and you might just get foliage. 
And if you dig up the bulb, you can kind of, people are always a lot of times nervous about digging up bulbs, but you learn an awful lot when you dig up a bulb because you can really tell what's going on. And if the bulb has split, that's the reason is that it just doesn't have enough energy to produce another flower. Okay. So if you want to guarantee it, you got to plant them every year. But if you have a good spot, you might be lucky and have them come back two, three. I've heard of people five years, you know, it just depends. Ka Kathleen, could you, uh, uh, this is not a bulb question, but uh, Tim wants to know what kind of lavender works for you? Um, the lavender you see there, much of it was started from seed um, many years ago, and I think it was Munstead, although I'm not 100% sure. That's one of the hardier ones. And um, so those have been there for 25, 30 years. And every year there's kind of one that I, pro I dig out and I replace. And I've found that um, Paquette's has a really nice selection of lavender that are field grown. And I'll often go down and replace, you know, one of the ones that I have to dig out with one from down there because they're, it's not like they're the little plants that you get, you know, in a little four inch pot. They usually have them in a gallon pot. They're big. You might pay 15 bucks, but it's a big lavender and they have hardy ones because you know they've, they've overwintered them themselves. So um, Munstead is good. Um, that's the only name I can think of right now. But I have, like I said, I've grown them from seed. And if you want to start a little hedge of yourself, yourself, um, it's an inexpensive way to do it. It takes a couple of years because they grow very slowly, but you can start them under lights, pot them up, and um, you know, might even put them in a nursery area for a year or two until they get bigger. And then um, that's what I did because I have, 20 plants and to buy that many was not something I was willing to do. Thank you. Jeanette, you want to unmute and fire your question? Sure. I have a beginner question. Um, <laughs> what, what do you do to prepare the soil? I think we all have, many of us have glacial till here. <laughs> Is there something? Here too. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the garden that you saw, um, the sort of raised garden there in front of my house, that was um, subsoil dug out when we made the, put in the foundation for the house. So talk about glacial till, it was just, it was the most inert material ever. And so all these years I've been just adding compost every single year. I have, usually have five yards of compost, six delivered every spring. Um, it costs a bunch, it costs like $400 because you got to pay for the compost and you got to have someone deliver it. But gardening's, you know, I don't have a lot of other vices. So that's what I do is I spend my money on compost. And um, I, that's what I'd say is, um, you know, sh keep your shredded leaves, try, you know, make as much compost as you can. I just can't make enough. So I buy it and just continue to dig it into the soil, loosen the soil with a, get a good, I swear by a garden fork as opposed to a spade, because you can really get it in when you have rocky soil like we have here and loosen up the soil, work in the compost, shredded leaves, um, whatever organic matter you can find and just keep doing it every single year. And it's hard work, but um, that's really the only way to build, um, uh, humus in the soil is to be adding organic matter and we just don't have a much in our soils. Um, so I would say loosen the soil because you want to get through that hard pan or whatever awful stuff you, you have um, and work that organic matter down into the soil as best you can. Um, if it's wet where you are, um, whatever you can do to kind of get the water away uh, raised beds is a good solution because it's sort of an easy way to be sure that you're going to get well-drained soil. You can also put better soil and compost into a raised bed. Um, so I have, you saw the beds in my vegetable garden, they're all raised about six inches or so. They don't have wooden sides or anything, but um, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you so much. But it's worth it. It just takes time. Um, okay. uh, Denise, you have a question? Denise Dean? Uh, yeah, I do. Thanks. Um, so I definitely have uh, daffodil envy, Kathleen. Um, I feel like I feel like it's amazing. Your gardens are beautiful. 
I feel like I put daffodils in every year. Um, yeah. I buy good quality daffodils. I, you know, I get them from gardeners or Brex or something. It's yeah. not like I'm buying them from Home Depot. But um, I, they just never really seem to naturalize a lot. I, I never really seem to get a lot more of them. Um, Is you know, it a after, sunny place that you have them? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a sunny, I mean, I have a pretty shady <laughs> lot, but I put them in the few sunny places I have. Yeah. That's strange because I just have the opposite. I just can't get, you know, I have bulbs that I, I dig out of the, every time I put a shovel in the ground, up comes daffodil bulbs pretty much at this point everywhere. Wow. And so wow. I just pile them up over by my driveway and sometimes. <laughs> well, let me know when you do that. And I'll come okay, I will. <laughs> I should put that on front porch forum. I, but there's been years where I have just, you know, no one's come to get them and I, they just go through the winter lying outside. Wow without being buried and in the spring they grow. I mean, it's wow. just like, so um, I think that not all daffodils are perennial for, at least for me, like I said, that the trumpets are in, in the naturalizing mixes, which usually include a lot of trumpets are the ones that are most perennial and will mostly multiply. Okay. The ones like I showed that the, the pretty, um, that like the doubles and some of the miniatures and stuff like that, yeah. you can't necessarily count on those um, right. to, to multiply. Um, but usually they come back. Yours don't even come back. They do come back. It's just, um, you know, considering I've planted so many of them, yeah. I just thought my yard would start to look like yours or a small piece of yeah, it. Yeah, right. And it, it really doesn't. I just feel like, um, I just feel like I'm. They're never really multiplying as much as I would well, expect. Well, I'll tell you what. It, it might be kind of like the my experience with um, snowdrops. You just need to get some daffodils from someone who lives nearby, and just put in a whole bunch, and then maybe you'll be in business. So, okay, uh, I'll keep trying. Find out where I live and come and see me. Okay. So you don't fertilize them or anything, or add no, anything. no. Okay. Right. And I have them like in the. There's some really soggy parts where. Um, there, there's a cut where we made this path down to the river and, you know, water just kind of seeps out of there. There's daffodils in there. They're out wow. by the road. I pitch daffodils. Like if I dig them out and I don't have time to deal with them, I'll just throw them over the bank. Now the whole back of the bank, they plant themselves. So <laughs> if you lay them, like sometimes I just don't feel like planting them and you can throw them into the field and they actually root and pull themselves down into the soil. Wow. So... They're amazing. Okay. So come and get some. Yeah. I'll keep trying. Thanks. Happy to, I'm happy to share with you. Thank you. We have a question in the chat. And I'm, is this Jeannie Deslitz? I'm assuming it's Jeannie rather than Ray. Uh, you said that you toss them all out and toss. So do you have to purchase new ones every year? Now, I'm not sure which bulb we're talking about here. Probably the tulips because everyone's really aghast that I throw those out. And I have to say it's you know, it kind of, it's not easy, but because I work for this bulb company and my job is to take photos of bulbs, they send me free bulbs. So I don't pay for those bulbs. And I always have to have new ones every year that I'm going to photograph. So um, I do, I do pitch them. Um, so the chances are that you aren't going to probably want to invest in 500 tulips every fall, um, but you might want to invest in a hundred. I mean, it's, you could probably get a hundred for 40 bucks, maybe even 200. And if you think of what you pay for tulips at the store, um, it's a lot of pleasure. You get to see all the weeks of seeing them come up and then they're in bud and then they're flowering and, you know, it's a whole experience. So um, yeah, I, I throw them out and I do replant them every fall. Uh, any other questions? I have a question if uh, anyone else in the group wants to raise their hand for a question. Okay. My question is, how much time do you spend on your gardening? <laughs> um, I don't know. If I ever added it up, I wouldn't do it. I, I don't know. I mean, you could ask my kids who are now grown and gone. <laughs> <laughs> they would set, tell, they would probably give you the real truth because um, there's lots of things I didn't do with them because I was in my garden. But um, my garden is the is my happy place, and I don't know, 
you know, I, I moved to Vermont when I was 19. And the reason I moved was to have a vegetable garden and a flower garden and be able to be a gardener. And so um, it's really, it's my calling. I, it's what I do. And so I'd say um, when the kids were little, I used to get up and I had a full-time job in Burlington. I would get up, um, you know, an hour early, like as soon as it was dawn, I'd go out and work for an hour in the garden. And then I'd come home and I'd also work at night an hour every day. So two hours a day that way and then every weekend. Now the garden is much easier because um, I've replaced a lot of the perennials with shrubs over the years. And I'd say, you know, it's really a full weekend day. Um, and then, but I don't really keep track of it because I just like being out there. Um, but it is, you, you know, I, I'm not someone who, if, if we had a boat and I like to go boating, you know, that'd be a problem. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Remarkable. I, I just, uh, I, I'm so interested in how you, how did you develop this? Where did this come from that you want to move to Vermont and have flowers and vegetables? Um, I think some of it is hereditary. My grandfather was a gardener and my grandmother and um, my other grandfather had a big vegetable garden. So I think we didn't have any gardens growing up. So I think it must have been, and I was not exposed to gardens ever because we lived in the suburbs of Minneapolis and there was no, nobody had a garden that I knew. Um, but I just, you know, it was the early seventies and, you know, I wanted to grow my own food and all that stuff, which I'd heard of, but I had no idea how that would ever work. So, um, and I read Scott, Helen and Scott Nearing's books and um, they were in Vermont and, um, I met someone whose grandparents lived in Vermont and I remember him telling me about what it was like to visit his grandparents every summer. And I thought it was kind of, it was such a fantasy land. I just thought, is there really a place like this? If there is, I'm going there. And so I did, I hitchhiked by myself and this, is, and I came here and that's what happened. So I've been here ever since. <laughs> yeah. Have you written your memoirs? No, you just heard them. They're pretty short. No, you hitchhiked from Minneapolis to Vermont? Yeah. People did that then. I mean, it's how people got around. I didn't have any money. You know, I mean, I was, I don't know. It wasn't that weird then. I wouldn't want to do it now, and I wouldn't want my kids to do it or my grandkids, but that's what you did. You know. I'm glad that you could do it then because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to come. It was a better, you know, safer times then. And how did you learn? How did doing that? Did you take classes? Did you go to gardening school? Did you? Um, pretty much learning. I, I went to UVM and, um, but, and I took a couple kind of plant type classes there. I was an environmental studies major, but most of the, um, plant stuff at UVM at that time in the in the late seventies was um, most of the agriculture things were was dairy. There was really not the kind of cool stuff that they have now for people who go to UVM about you know growing food and flowers and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it was pretty books and friends and just trial and error. It's been a long time. I mean, I've had. You're not seeing all the stuff that went over the bank, you know, twice, th five times much as much stuff died, you know. <laughs> Other questions? Anybody want to make a comment or share your own gardening stories or questions? I'd be happy to. Um, maybe if you get back in touch, Martha, in the summertime, if we can all be out and about safely, um, I'd be happy to invite people over someday. Oh, that would be I mean, I've had lots of garden tours here in the years past. Um, I haven't done it for a while, just for no reason. But um, yeah, that it's always fun to share at the garden. That would be wonderful. And next uh, next, fr next Friday, same time, same place, Kathleen will be sharing uh, her uh, experiences with summer bulbs. And then after that, we will have her final program on dahlias. I can't imagine a program on dahlias. So I'm waiting, I'm just waiting to hear what we can learn about dahlias. Uh, 
So thank you very much. And if anyone has any comments about vegetables, we're going to do another series on vegetables. So if you want to uh, have questions, we don't even know what we're going to do. We've got Paul Feenan, who works at High Mowing, who's, do you know, oh, good. Do you know Paul? I, not personally, but I know he's, he knows a lot about vegetables. So he'll be helping us with that. So if anybody has anything that they specifically want to know about vegetable growing, let us know, let me know. And thank you, Kathleen. I look forward to Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed some color today. Oh, it was beautiful. Thank you. Good. Good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Fabulous. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. All right, see you next week if you want to join. It'll be lilies and um, lots of other stuff. Great. I'll keep you in suspense. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you.